Good morning, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to you as we worship together uh, in this online service. It's been quite a crazy week, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. But uh, it started with our beautiful uh, day of giving service last Sunday. And uh, while I'm just telling you about that, we'll show you some of the photos from that. It started off with the service um, in the morning. And we had uh, Joan Labaskachny visiting all the way from Scotland and joining in the music team. We had the Barker family joining us, and you can see a picture of them here. Uh, the uh, foster children's faces are blurred because it's not uh, proper to put their faces on any form of public media. And uh, we were able to just say a word of thanks and express our gratitude to them for their years here at Emmanuel. We also presented to them a gift of an inverter and batteries that will see them through all the load shedding. And uh, then after the, and, and then came the, the actual giving part of the service where people responded to, to God's goodness and God's love. They came forward, brought their gifts to the altar, and then also took a moment to write on our Thanksgiving board, which you can see here. And there, uh, people just wrote the things that they were grateful for. And I must tell you, it's quite moving to, to read through all the little entries that were made. And, and you see how good God has been to so many people. The wonderful news is that so far, our day of giving has already raised 74,000 rand, which is quite amazing in these difficult times. And we are so grateful for that. Uh, we are aware that some people may be waiting till the end of the month. And if you do want to still give something for the day of giving, you can do that. Um, simply write DOG on your reference and, and offer that to the Lord as an act of thanksgiving. After the service, we shifted into party mode and we had our chicken burgers and, and everybody gathered together. And it really was just so fantastic. To bring everybody together. We had the Jumping Castle, we had folk working hard in the Brise, um, and a lovely time was had by all. The verdict was that the chicken burgers came out really well, and we really enjoyed ourselves, and it was lovely to catch up with the Barkers. It was just such a privilege to be able to celebrate together. And a very, very big thank you to all who were involved in making this day such a special day. Thanks to those who came. Thanks to those who brought their gift to God. The rest of the week uh, that uh, for, for us as a family was quite a difficult one in the sense that uh, my brother and his family are emigrating to the USA and they departed on Tuesday. And so Monday and Tuesday were spent uh, helping them get their final packing done and getting them off to the airport. Uh, many of you have been through this, and so you know what I'm talking about. It's, uh, it's bittersweet because it's an exciting adventure for them, but for us, the, the tough sense of, of now the many miles that will be between us. And, and so this week we haven't been quite ourselves, and, and for that reason, this morning I'm going to be uh, using a sermon that, that I preached back in October 2020, just as we were uh, starting to open church services again. But it was from a series called uh, Overcomers, and it's on the life of Joseph. And it talks about the ups and downs in Joseph's life, how he coped with that, and also how God worked in his life. I think there is much about this message that is still appropriate and, uh, and timeous and applicable. And so I do pray that it will be a blessing to you. Right at the end of Genesis, when Joseph's brothers are really afraid that after uh, Jacob has died, that Joseph might take his revenge on his brothers. And Joseph utters that famous line. He says, you may have meant evil, but God turned it out for good. And in the same way, Paul writes a similar thing in Romans 8 verse 28. And this is our call to worship. 
For in all things, God is at work for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Let's worship God together. God, King of the heavens and King of the earth, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise your name. You are good and gracious, holy and just. You are loving and merciful. You are abounding in grace and, and full of forgiveness. We praise you, Lord, for the beauty of the world that you have surrounded us with and the beauty of our lives. In the ups and downs of our lives, the, the warmth and, and the vitality that we experience in the intensity of our relationships and in the fullness of our laughter, we recognize, Lord, that you have created us beautifully and able to experience such love, able to, to experience such beauty. And we praise you, Lord, for creating us in your image and in the little bit that we see of you reflected in us, we realize, Lord, that you are a magnificent God. But Father, when we stray from you, we turn the good that you give us into darkness. Forgive us for our laziness, for our hard hearts. Forgive us for our tempers and our unjustified anger. Forgive us, Lord, for our ingratitude and our impatience and our insincerity. Forgive us, Lord, when we take for granted all that you give us and we moan so quickly and complain so loudly. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Thank you for the cross of Christ where we find forgiveness and restoration and help us, Lord, to hold on to you in this week that we might love you more. And so be with us in this service, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Hi kids, I've been making these strange wire sculptures to show you this morning. Um, they're all made out of copper wire and they're each a little different. Um, and although they look okay just lying here like this, they're much more interesting when you hook them up to a strong magnet attached to a battery like that. And if you put them in the right way on top of the magnet attached to the battery and especially if they touch the battery then they spin round and round like this. Isn't that amazing? Now the reason that they're spinning round is because each of them um, makes a little motor. When the wire contacts the battery, um, it gets electric current flowing through it. Uh, and that, in combination with a strong magnetic field, uh, makes a very simple but very cute little motor. These are all the different ones I want to show you. Now, if you don't touch the wire to the battery like that, or if you don't have the magnet, then the thing doesn't spin around, round and round. And we're a bit like that too. If we want to do God's will, we need to stand firm in His Word. Uh, we need to have His Spirit flowing through us, and we need to be in touch with God. Um, just like these little wires. Uh, that stand on the magnet, that have the current flowing through them uh, and are in touch with the battery to get that current to flow. As uh, the Apostle Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. Let's pray. Dear Father God, thank you that you are so amazing and powerful. Thank you that everything comes from you. Thank you that you have given us your word and your spirit, and that you listen to us and talk to us. Help us to remain in touch with you every day. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The story of Joseph spans 13 chapters and comprises nearly a quarter of the book of Genesis. And that is strange because Joseph isn't even the most important character in Genesis and not even 
the genealogy of Christ goes back to Joseph. It goes back to Judah. And Joseph would lose his place in the 12 tribes because he, his name would be replaced by the names of his two grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and, and the half tribes named after each of them. And so the question is, why would the story of Joseph be given so much airtime in the book of Genesis? The commentators call Joseph's story the Joseph saga. And herein lies Joseph's importance, because a saga is really about the ups and downs of our lives. When, when somebody has a saga, then we prepare ourselves for, for that journey where things can go well for a while and then they go downhill for a while. And, and we, we journey with a person through the ups and downs of their lives. And as we do so, we learn from their lives and we learn from their relationship with God. And that's exactly what the story of Joseph is about. Joseph teaches us how to walk with God in the long run and the lessons that we need to learn along the way. Now, just to refresh your memory, the story of Joseph is one that we've learned from Sunday school days. It starts when Joseph is born and he's one of 12 brothers. But God gives him big dreams. Unfortunately, Joseph's dad treated him as a favorite, giving him a beautiful robe and as the classic musical calls it, the Technicolor dream coat. And Jacob may as well have painted a target on poor old Joseph's back because his brothers hate him. And then when Joseph shares his dreams about uh, wheat sheaves that bow down and, and sun and moon and stars that bow down to, to his sheaf and his star, his brothers really just have nothing but hatred for him. And so one day, Joseph's brothers grab him and throw him in a pit, intending to kill him. But Reuben persuades them to spare his life. And they decide to sell him into slavery, faking his death to his father. Joseph is then carried off to Egypt, where he is sold as a slave to Potiphar. And in Potiphar's house, Joseph thrives, and he soon becomes the head servant, where Potiphar's wife, takes notice of him and tries to seduce him. But Joseph resists. And in her fury at, at being resisted, Potiphar's wife accuses Joseph of misbehavior. And Potiphar has Joseph thrown into prison. There in prison, Joseph once again moves towards the top, being given more and more responsibility. And he interprets the dreams of the baker and the wine, the, 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 um, the wine taster and those dreams uh, and those interpretations are proven true. But Joseph is left in prison until the day that Pharaoh has a dream that he doesn't understand. And Joseph is brought in to interpret it. And in, in, the, in the interpretation, he shows such wisdom that Pharaoh appoints him as second in command in all of Egypt. And of course, Joseph had predicted the seven years of plenty and the seven years of drought. And in the seven years of drought and famine, Joseph's brothers come to Egypt in search of food. And after Joseph puts them through some exercises to see whether their hearts had changed, he eventually reveals himself to them and the family is reunited. But in the midst of this story, we recognize that Joseph must have had some internal doubts and struggles. And I'm sure that there were times in Joseph's life where he said, Lord, you gave me these big dreams, but now I'm stuck in a pit. Or, Lord, you gave me these big dreams, but now I'm in prison. Or, Lord, you made other people's dreams come true, and I'm still in prison. Or maybe even later in life, Lord, you gave me these big dreams and I'm second in command in Egypt, but my brothers are standing in front of me and they don't even recognize me. And we realize that Joseph walks a long path 
of struggle and yet faithfulness, of life's ups and downs, and yet he remains true to God's call on his life. We're going to listen to the section of Joseph's story where he is arrested and thrown into prison. Let's listen to God's word. The reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 39, verse 19, to chapter 40, verse 8. When Potiphar heard the story his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care, because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Some time later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard. In the same prison where Joseph was confined, the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream. The same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, Why are your faces so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts bring you praise and glory now and forevermore. Amen. I'm sure almost everybody is familiar with the words of, of that song from Joseph in his Technicolor dream coat, where Joseph sings, I closed my eyes, drew back the curtain to see for certain what I thought I knew. Far, far away, someone was weeping, but the world was sleeping. Any dream will do. I wore my coat with golden lining, bright colors shining, wonderful and new. And in the east the dawn was breaking, and the world was waking. Any dream will do. A crash of drums, a flash of light, my golden coat flew out of sight. The colors faded into darkness, and I was left alone. These beautiful words so poetically describe what happens in Joseph's life, not once, but twice and thrice, that Joseph is at the pinnacle of, of the success that he could reach at that point in his life, and all is taken away. There are three pairs of dreams in Joseph's story. There are Joseph's two dreams, the dreams of the sheaves and the sun, moon and stars. And then there are the dreams of the baker and the cupbearer. And finally, there's Pharaoh's dreams about the calves or the cows and, and the ears of wheat. Strangely enough, two, two of those sets of dreams are fulfilled quite quickly. The baker and the cupbearer's dreams are fulfilled very soon. And Pharaoh's dreams of seven years of plenty happen almost immediately, followed by the seven years of famine. But in the midst of all of these dreams and these dreams coming true, Joseph's dreams remain unfulfilled. Or maybe we could argue that they are fulfilled to a point and then he has to begin again. But at the end of our reading today, 
we have Joseph in prison. And we need to take note that, strangely enough, Joseph is in a fancy prison. He's in a VIP prison. He's in a prison with Pharaoh's top prisoners. And I find this strange because Potiphar was a significant person in Pharaoh's palace and he was in charge of Pharaoh's security. And if he really believed that Joseph had made a pass at his wife, I would have thought that Potiphar would have made sure that Joseph was thrown in the darkest hole in the furthest corner of Egypt. But the fact that Joseph is put into a luxury prison tells me that maybe Potiphar knew something about his wife's nature and character and that Potiphar still had some sympathy and compassion towards Joseph. But Joseph is in prison and even after he interprets the dreams of the baker and the cupbearer, he remains in prison for another two years. And I imagine Joseph's sense of disconnection. I can only imagine Joseph's sense of frustration. During this corona time, we have had to deal with the sense of being in prison. And we've had to deal with the heartache of delayed dreams. And I think there are many lessons, and I, and I don't think I need to go into the detail of how, for many of us, we have felt trapped and we have felt disappointed. But I think there are some important lessons that Joseph and Joseph's God can teach us in this time. And so let's start by looking at Joseph. The first thing that strikes me about Joseph is that Although Joseph starts out seeming arrogant when he shares his dreams with his brothers and with his parents, that's the only time in the whole of Joseph's story that he comes across as arrogant or proud. Every other time that we see Joseph interacting with people around him, he is both respectful and wise in his dealings with others. And he constantly points away from himself and towards God. And I find this humility both attractive and very important to take note of. The second thing that strikes me about Joseph is that Joseph, even with the number of disappointments that he has, picks himself, every, picks himself up every time and chooses to work hard and to choose faithfully. I find it striking that Joseph resists temptation. He resists temptation with Potiphar's wife, telling her that he is grateful for all that Potiphar has done for him and couldn't sin against Potiphar or against God by giving in to her seduction. He also resists the temptation to take the glory for himself when he interprets the cupbearer and baker's dreams. And he does the same when he is with Pharaoh. I like the fact that Joseph is diligent in using his gifts. And Joseph has two clear gifts. The first gift is this supernatural ability to interpret dreams. But the other gift is a much more practical one, and that's the gift of leadership. And Joseph uses that gift generously and wisely. Fifthly, I find it striking that Joseph is caring in the way that he looks after those placed in his care. And it's significant that when the baker and the cupbearer have these disturbing dreams, Joseph immediately picks up on, on their dis-ease and is thoughtful enough to inquire about that. It speaks of someone who isn't just doing his duty but who really cares about people. We see the same kind of care as he works with his brothers, trying to bring the very best out of them. I think it's significant that Joseph honors God at every opportunity. And it's clear to me that he has stayed in contact with God and connected to God, very much like Andrew reminded us this morning as we looked at those copper coils spinning 
around those batteries as they stayed in contact and under the influence of those magnets. Joseph is someone who is spirit-led and in touch with God. I think it's significant that Joseph is able to forgive his brothers. And finally, right at the end of his life, at a point where he could afford to, to hold a grudge or, or to become his own judge, jury and executioner, Joseph chooses to see God's hand at work in his story. And when his brothers fear a reprisal from Joseph, Joseph reminds them, you intended it for evil, but God turned it out for good. And Joseph is able to look back on his life and see the golden thread of God's providence woven through the ups and downs of his life. You and I need to learn from Joseph. What do we learn about God in Joseph's story? Well, I think there are four quick points that we can make. And the first is that God has a plan. And God gives dreams. And Joseph's dream that was given to him as a young man went through a long process of ups and downs. And yet, by the end of Joseph's life, God honored him and brought everything about that he had promised. God is at work in our world in spite of its brokenness, in spite of its chaos. God has a plan. God is at work, and God gives dreams. Secondly, I think it's important to note that every time that Joseph succeeds in the Joseph saga, the writer of Genesis is very careful to point out that it is God that blesses him, and that God makes the work of Joseph's hands fruitful. God is the one who helps us, and God is the one who blesses the work of our hands. The third point that I've already alluded to it, but it needs to stand on its own as well, is that God can work in our world in spite of the evil that is there, in spite of the evil of Joseph's brothers, in spite of the evil of Potiphar's wife, in spite of the evil or, or the forgetfulness of the cupbearer, God is at work and God brings about his glory. And finally, God uses us to work with him. God, in his grace and his goodness, lets you and me be his co-workers. And Joseph is God's instrument to bring about great blessing to the known world. And it is because of Joseph that the famine's effects were mitigated because of what Joseph's leadership had brought about. And so, let me bring all of this to a conclusion. But before I do that, I need to put my finger up and, and go on a brief digression. And that digression is that when we read the story of Joseph, we need to recognize that Joseph is also in some ways a type or a foreshadowing or a blueprint of Christ that there are some similarities in Joseph's story that prepare us for what Jesus would do in our world. Let's have a look at that. If we think about it, Jesus was betrayed by Judas just as Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. Both Joseph and Jesus were sold for a slave's wages. Both Joseph and Jesus experienced God's blessing on their lives and they were empowered by God's Holy Spirit. Joseph to interpret dreams, Jesus to perform miracles, to chase out evil spirits and even to raise people from the dead. Joseph seemed to be dead and certainly was dead in the eyes of his father Jacob but then came back to life and we know that of course Joseph finally died. Jesus died and then rose again, never to die. Joseph 
detested his brothers and then forgave them. Jesus died on the cross in our place, even while we were still sinners, even while we were unrepentant, and he forgave us completely. And so just as Joseph's leadership was salvation for the known world at that time, Jesus is the salvation for all of humankind. And while Joseph was able to give people wheat for bread, Jesus is the bread of life. And so we remember that the story of Joseph prepares us for what Jesus would one day do. And so now, let me conclude. This beautiful story of Joseph, Joseph the overcomer, Joseph the man who had been through the saga of life's ups and downs, the disappointments of building up and building up and then losing everything in a moment. Joseph teaches us to be patient and to work hard while we wait. Joseph teaches us to be caring to others, to stay in touch with God, and let God use us. Joseph teaches us to honor God and to forgive others. And in Joseph's story, we encounter a God, a God who is a dream giver, a God who has a plan, a God who is at work in spite of evil, and a God who helps us and strengthens us and accomplishes his purposes through us and can rescue and save as he works through you and me. And it's my prayer that like Joseph, we would respond to God, trust in him and let him be glorified in us. In Jesus' name, Amen. While we can't take up a physical offering, we can still respond to God's word and goodness by offering ourselves. Let's pray. Father, you have given us everything, our talents, our time, our treasure, and a new life in Jesus. 
We offer you our lives and dedicate our talents, time and treasure to serving you as you call and lead us. We accept your invitation to work with you as you grow your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, as we have heard your word and we recognize that Joseph's life in many ways was so much harder than our own, when we recognize how easily we complain and yet we have so much. Thank you for our family. Thank you for our homes. Thank you for our opportunities. Thank you for our blessings. Thank you for your word and Lord, thank you for Joseph and help us to learn from his example. Help us to put into practice what we've seen in him. And thank you, Lord, that you are the God who gives dreams and has plans. The God who works in us. The God who enables us and empowers us and strengthens us. Thank you, Lord, that we are never alone. Lord, we want to pray for our world and for those who are going through hardships and difficulties. We pray especially for those near and dear to us who right now are not well or are going through tough personal circumstances, maybe financial difficulty or difficulty in the workplace. Lord, you know the circumstances and you know the names that we whisper before you. Be with them, we pray. And finally, Lord, be with us. Be with us as we face the week ahead of us. Help us to be all that you have called us to be and help us to shine with your light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul. Worship His holy name. Say thy name before, O my soul. I'll worship your holy name.
It's been a great privilege to be with you this morning. And I do pray that you have found the service meaningful, even though it was an old sermon. I do pray that the message was fresh, applicable and and inspiring. And certainly as, as I listened to it again and reflected on it, there were many valuable points from Joseph's life and from God's faithfulness that struck me again. And I pray that we'll go into this week putting into, into practice the things that we saw in, jo in Joseph's life and remembering that God is the God who gives dreams, who has a plan, who is at work in you and me and empowers you and me that we can make a difference. And so, may the love of God enfold us and be with us. May he strengthen us and equip us to serve him. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us, now and forevermore. Amen. And here are the birthdays and anniversaries of Emmanuel and Grace. On Monday the 24th, it's Hangwani. On Tuesday the 25th, Tina and Gaku. Gaku is 10 years old and Liam is also turning 10. On Friday the 28th, it's Louisa and Craig. And then our anniversaries. On Monday, it's Dale and Dani. They've been married for seven years. And Eileen and Joachim for 44 years. Congratulations to them. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for birthdays and anniversaries. Bless everyone this week who will be celebrating this special day. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> 